series. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been examining, we've been examining the importance of walking, developing and walking in faith. Because faith has to be developed in order before you walk in it. You have to develop faith. And the thing about it is God wants us to own our faith. He wants everybody here to own our faith because nobody else can own your faith for you. Nobody else can have a relationship with God for you. You can't live vicariously through somebody. You have to do it yourself. But the definition of faith can be found in Hebrews chapter 11. And we've, we've, we've actually went over this verse many times, different, different translations. Today I'm using an NIV. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and, and assurance about what we do not see. So faith, ha faith has to do with confidence and assurance. And confidence, the definition of confidence, it's a feeling or belief that you can do something well or succeed at it. You know, we all have areas in our life where we, we feel confident that we can do things. And then we have areas that we don't. You know, I'm not confident in singing. I'm not, I'm not a singer. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not good at singing, so I'm not, I'm not going to be dropping any albums. I'm not going to be dropping any CDs out there because I basically, I'm not good at it. Um, and how, how do I know this? Because I know myself and also my daughters tell me all the time, Dad, you can't sing. You can't sing. You can't sing. And uh, that's okay. You know, we're, a lot of us are vocally challenged, aren't we? I'm not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too afraid to admit it. I'm not, I'm not prideful about it. I just, I, I'm not a good singer, but that's okay. And it's okay because Psalms 101 says, 100, uh, verse 1 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all, all ye lands. And you know what? Psalms 101 is a, is a, is a verse that all of us non-singers, raise your hand if you can't sing. <laughs> this, this is a verse that we can, we can claim by faith. When we make a noise, when we sing, it's a joyful noise, even if our neighbor doesn't, um, they don't believe it. Or they, don't, they don't agree with it. Right? Amen? Amen? Amen. But faith also has to do with assurance. And the definition of assurance is a confident feeling or attitude, a feeling of being certain about something. And as I said, I'm, I'm very assured. I'm actually extremely assured that I can't sing. I know that. I know I can. And, 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 and lots of people told me I can't sing. My wife told me I can't sing. My daughters. And I'm saying probably you if you heard me. I couldn't say some of you too. But our Christian walk is a faith thing. It's a faith thing to be a Christian. And our relationship with God is a faith thing. We walk in faith because we are confident that God does everything well and can succeed at, at, at anything. And this in return, this in return, this in return gives us assurance that God and his word are true and can be trusted. Because we have confidence. We have confidence that he does everything well. God does everything well. If God touches it, God made everything. He does everything well. He does everything well. The Bible says in, Mark, in Matthew 19, 26, that with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Not with you, not with me, not with our company that we work for, but with God, all things are possible. And Matthew 19, 26 is a faith booster. It's, it's good. It's Matthew 19, 26 is good food for our spirit. Remember, we talked about your hunger um, and eating good things. Eating the word is good. Matthew 19, 26 is good for you. It's good for your life. It's good for your spirit. And it should give you confidence and assurance about God and his word. Amen. Matthew 19, 26. Write it down if you need to. Put it on your refrigerator. But last, the last two weeks, we looked, all, we looked at how faith begins and then develops. Owning your faith uh, begins with having a knowledge of God. That's where it starts off. That's the, that's the, that's the, first, the first piece of, of developing and owning your faith. The knowledge of God is what begins our journey, the journey of owning your faith. When you have knowledge of God, that begins the journey of owning your faith, which is what we're supposed to do. We're, we're called to own our faith. And the Bible is clear that the knowledge of God is undeniable. Undeniable. Romans 1.20, and we've, we've read this uh, before, and this is a different version right here. It says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. 
So simply put, simply put, not having a knowledge of God is in inexcusable. There's no excuses. And God, God says right here, the, the word says it's, it's inexcusable. I'm saying it's inexcusable. And it's okay if you say it's inexcusable too. If we have neighbors or people that you know that say God's not real, you can say, no, yes, he is. He is real. He is real. I know it is. I know he is. But the truth of all, the truth is that God's invisible attributes annihilate, annihilate doubt and excuses that God isn't real. You know, we see the, we see the moon, we see the sun, we see the birds and the bees, right? You see them every day, right? It's summer right now. We see, we see, we see birds out. We see butterflies, bees, um, mosquitoes. Those are things that we, we know. But what about our bodies? Everybody, as I'm saying, everybody right now, tap your elbows. Tap your elbows. Touch your head. Touch your head. Touch your, pinch your nose. Pinch your nose. You know, our bodies, um, our bodies are, are, you know, we all have bodies, and our bodies have 206 bones. You know that? 206 bones. Not one less, not one more. And it's a picture right here. It shows you the bones of our body right here. 60 lower limb bones, pelvic girdle bones, two, sternum and rib bones, 26 vertebrae, and the list goes on and on. But just think about how we were designed and how they work together. That's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible that it's incredible that that we were put together like this because if we don't, if something's not put together correctly, we're not, we're not doing something that's gonna make us immobile, right? But it had to take someone who was brilliant to design a human body. I'm telling you right now, you can, I'm saying, you can look at your neighbor. They're not smart enough to do, design a, a human body. Because I know some of y'all would have some, it, it would be, your arm would be down here and your leg would be up here and, and, your, and your mouth would be somewhere that, where it shouldn't be. But it took, it, took, it took somebody brilliant. Only God cre could create this, this design. Only God could create the human body. But after having the knowledge of God, the process of owning your faith continues to develop by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. And we, we read this verse. This is a different translation, amplified uh, translation. So faith comes from hearing what is told. And what is heard comes, from by, the, comes by the preaching of the message concerning Christ. Developing faith, um, it, it, it requires hearing the gospel. It requires hearing the truths and reality, realities of the Bible. If you're not hearing the word, your faith is as good as dead. You're not going to have faith. If, you're not, if, you can't, if you don't hear the word of God, it, your faith is never going to grow. That's, it, that's why it's good to get into a good church like our church where we're hearing the word of God, where we're growing because we're developing faith. How many of you, how many of you out here have developed um, some more faith since being here? Your faith has increased. It's, I'm saying my, my faith is increased. Just reading the Bible, it just, it just, my faith is increased, and we're increasing together. We're doing this as a body, right? But it's a sad, um, it's just, it's sad though that, um, that, um, you know, that some Christians are living dead because they're not hearing the word of God. And these are self-proclaimed Christians that you know they go to church every week. You can go to church and still be dead. You understand that? You can come to church for 50 years. You can come to church to your last breath. It's still not growing, Christ. It's still not having any faith. Have the same faith that you started with when you said, I want to become a Christian. You have to build it. It has to grow. You know, being a Christian is not just saying that you follow Jesus. Christianity. I want you everybody here. I want you, I want you to hear it. Christianity is a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. Like I stated last week, it's more than self-identification. Just because you wear a cross doesn't mean that you're a Christian. Oh, I got a cross. I follow Jesus. Then you're going up there living like the devil. That doesn't, that's not, that's not following Jesus. That's not a disciple. And my wife told me, she was telling me uh, a couple, like last week or two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, I can't remember the time frame, but she said that many people are identifying as Christians. They're identifying as a Christian. They're not a Christian, but they're identifying as a Christian. And I don't get it because you're either a Christian or you're not a Christian. Amen. That's the truth. You either own your faith or you don't own your faith. 
And there's no half stepping with God. You either choose heaven or you, cho you do not choose heaven. You choose heaven or you're not choosing heaven. Because when judgment comes, you're either, you either enter heaven or you don't enter, enter heaven. There's no, there's no, um, you know what? Um, Jesus isn't going to be like, okay, yeah, you can, you can put one foot in heaven and one foot outside of heaven. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. There's no self, there's no self-proclaimed Christians. You are either a Christian or you're not a Christian. That's the, the basic, that's the bottom line. I'm not saying that you don't have stuff that you're dealing with because we all have stuff that we're dealing with, right? We all have stuff that we're, we're working on. God's working on in us and through us to, 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 to become more like Jesus and look like more like Jesus, right? Amen. So that's, that's, that's how it is. But the, the title of today's message is called Own Your Faith Part 3. So after you have a knowledge of God and, and you're able to hear the word of God, the next step in on your faith is living out the word of God. You have to live it out. You got one of the, everybody say live it out. Live, everybody on Facebook, live it out, Facebook. Live it out, church. Live it out. Look at your neighbor and say, live it out. You got to live it out. Faith requires living it out. Walking, uh, walking in faith means living it. Breathing it. Choosing it and, it and putting it first before anything and anybody. And I'm talking about your wife. I'm not saying I know we got we have people here that are married and that have been married before. But you your faith is you have to put it before your wife or husband or your family or your kids. You have to do what God's asking you to do. And it's hard. It's hard because it often makes people upset. People get all gripey and stuff like that, and they start whining. They start whining. Sometimes when people whine, I say, you want some cheese with that wine? You want some cheese with that wine? Because we can go to the store and get you some cheese. My own cheddar, some Kobe Jack, whatever you want. So we, you name it, we'll go, I'll go get it for you. But only if it, it makes people upset. It, ca it often causes conflict and disagreements. But this is part of the package. When you own your faith, you have to realize that not everybody's going to be digging you. And you're not going to be digging other people, too. They're not going to be digging you. And we see that, and we want, and I want to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 14. I want to turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 14. And not, not everybody was digging Jesus. You understand? Not everybody was digging Jesus. Not everybody said, you know what, Jesus, you know what? We're going to trust you. We're going to follow you. God's words, the Bible, tells us that Jesus and the Pharisees didn't get along. They didn't get along. And that's probably an understatement. That's probably an understatement. The, the, the Pharisees were the teachers of the law. And Jesus came to fulfill the law. Teachers of the law come to fulfill the law. There's already right there, there's some, there's some, there's some head button right there. Head button. There were, over, there were over 600 laws and commands in the Old Testament, which included the Mosaic Law. Over 600. And if we want to be exact, right, 613 laws and commands. Is that a lot? Is that a lot? Is that a lot to, is that a lot to, a lot to, 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 to not break on a daily basis? You better, you, sure, you, you, you better be sure it is. It's a lot of laws. 613 laws and commands. That's a lot. That's a lot to live up to. That's a high standard. I'm not saying we don't got standards, but that's a high standard to live up to. The Pharisees were the teachers of the law, and they said you can't break them. You can't break it. But the Pharisees, they, um, the, 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 the laws and commands became part of the Jewish, Jewish ethical standards and expectations. Which is, that's, you know, that's, that's what they were living by. But the, um, the Pharisees based their relationship with God by adhering strictly to these laws and commands that were impossible, impossible to live up to. That's why there's so much blood in the temple. Because, you know what? We, we, we try not to sin, but we, people sin. Amen? Is that true? People do things that we shouldn't do. And, and it required a blood sacrifice. Lots of bloody animals. How many of y'all like blood? I know one person right now that doesn't like blood. If she sees blood, she will pass out. And her, she's right standing, sitting right back there in the, the booth. She, anytime she sees a drop of blood, she passes out. But this is what blood, it took blood to, um, to, 
to cover our sins. That's why, that's why there was a lot of blood in the temple from after animal sacrifice. Sin required a blood, blood sacrifice. In 70 AD, I want you to check this out. In 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by Rome, so no sacrifices could be performed. But no, the number either need it right now because of what Jesus did, right? We don't need any sacrifice. But there's still the Jewish community, the Jews who um, who won't accept Jesus as the Messiah, still are under that old covenant. But Jesus, Jesus, Jesus already, he was the, 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 the sinless lamb. And no, there's no more sacrifice needed anymore. He fulfilled the law. So we are free from trying to live up to a standard that never could be accomplished. I don't know about you, but I know out of 613 command, uh, commands and laws, I know that I just, that would be a lot of stress and pressure. Everybody would be walking around with timid on eggshells. Oh man, if I do this and stuff, I broke them and stuff like that. Then okay, then go get a uh, Chuck, Chuck and Bob. Go get a go get an animal because we're gonna have to do a sin offering again. Because that's just the way it is. Because um, a lot of it's just the, the old love, the old covenant was just it was it was it was in, in, impossible to live up to. But now we are now we now remain right with God because of our faith in Jesus that justifies us. Justification. Means God looks at us if we had never sinned at all. We are justified by Jesus. Justification. We're no longer slaves of sin. We have a hope in the future because of Jesus. Amen. It's because of Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the law, but he didn't abolish it. Some people look at, they looked at Jesus and were like, what do you mean? You have a new law? No, I didn't, he didn't abolish it. He fulfilled the law. We're now under the law of Christ. We are under the law of Jesus. Amen. That takes a lot of stress out of your day every day. 613 versus the law of Christ. John 14, John chapter 14 gives us insight about the law of Christ, which we're under right now, which we've under since he endured the cross. He's resurrected and he came and he's sitting in heaven right now. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, do you love Jesus? Say Amen. Obey my commandments. That's what he says. If you love me, obey my commandments. If you live by the law of Christ, you are obeying the Mosaic law. Because if you love, if you you if you love uh, Jesus, you are obeying the Mosaic law and the six hundred thirteen laws um, that were there before Jesus came on earth. That's why he. That's why it says that Jesus fulfilled the law, but he didn't abolish it. We're under the umbrella of the law of Jesus now. And this is what Jesus was trying to teach the Pharisees, but they wouldn't, they weren't having it because they were not accepting the word. The Pharisees read the word, they heard the word, but they chose not to live out of it. It's a choice. Everything in life is a choice. Everything in life is a choice. I don't care if it's from what you wear to what you eat for breakfast to, to whatever is up coming to church, whatever. It is a choice. Everything is a choice in life. That's I always I always think about it. How could you describe life? People like I know I don't I don't know if people don't necessarily ask me, but if people ask me, I would tell them life is about it's all a choice. It's a choice what you do, regardless of circumstances, regardless of whatever you, you know whatever is thrown in your way. You have a, cho a choice. But the Pharisees couldn't accept the fact that Jesus was establishing a new covenant, which was radical. The law of Christ was radical compared to like the old covenant. It's radical. You have this Messiah coming down from coming down to earth, taking the burden of sin. And now if you put your faith in him and trust in him, you are good. You don't have to live by, you don't have to live by these, these laws and commands. Strictly, you live by the law of Christ now. But the truth is, is that change is hard for many. I don't care who you are, I don't care how old you are, change is hard for many. Raise your hand if it's been hard for you at times. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're not raising your hand, you're lying because it's hard. Because even when you get older, your knees are younger, your elbows are younger, your eyes are younger, your ears are younger. And it's hard when they change. 
It's hard getting older. It's hard getting older because it's hard to change. My knee don't work the same way it used to work. I'm sure yours don't too. You lost strength. You're not, you don't have the energy like you used to. That's why when we see kids around here, we see kids around here. It's awesome to see kids because kids have energy and they're so, so full of life and they just yell and run and stuff like that. I don't care. I want kids to run in here and yell and I just want, I want to hear kids. I want to hear kids. I want to see, I want to hear, hear more kids and more kids. I want this, I want this, a whole, whole basement full of kids. 150 of them. But truth, but change is hard for many. Preferences and traditions often override change. Preferences, I prefer things. This is always, this is my tradition, the tradition of this and that. They often override change. People, many people refuse to move forward in their faith development because they won't embrace change, which it's going to happen naturally. It, take, it takes boldness and, and courage to own your faith. B boldness and courage to own your faith. This is exactly what got Jesus and his followers in trouble with the Pharisees because they own their faith. Owning your faith, not necessarily in America, but it can get you in trouble. It can get you killed. Let's turn to Matthew uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. It says at about, this, at about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath. Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested, Look, your disciples are breaking the law of Jesus by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. You know, many of the Pharisees were legalistic. And breaking off some grain, even though you're hungry, what do you do? What's it, what's it, what's it, what's it called, that, that commercial? If you're hungry, you like break yourself a Kit Kat bar? Is that clown night or something like that? I don't know. But but if you're hungry, you say you're hungry. If you're hungry, you're hungry. But it was a violation of Sabbath um, by doing what they did by getting the grain. And there was others. There were other things that violated Sabbath according to the Pharisees. Ancient rabbis taught that on Sabbath a man could not carry. Just check this out. This is how legalistic it was. A man on Sabbath could not carry something in his right hand. Put your right hand up right now. Put your right hand up. Put your left hand up. Couldn't carry something in your left hand. Um, across his chest. Put the, rub, your, rub your hand against your, across your chest. Or your sho or his shoulder. Your shoulder. But he, could, but he could carry something with the back of his hand. All right. The back of your hand, you could carry something. But nothing. Not with your right or left hand, but something in the back of your hand. And it just, it gets better than this. Back of your hand with your foot or elbow. Foot or elbow, okay, I'm gonna carry something like this. I'm gonna carry something with my foot. I'm gonna carry something with my elbow. I'm gonna carry something with my elbow. Or the hair, or, 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 in, or in the air. On the hair. In the hem of a shirt, or in a shoe, or sandal. There's a lot of rules. Even, let me, I want you to get this right, how, how legalistic it was. Even, even tying a knot was forbidden unless you were a woman. We got a couple women here. You can tie a knot. We couldn't tie a knot. A woman could tie a knot in her girdle. If a bucket of water had to be raised from a well, a man could not tie a rope to the bucket, but a woman could tie her girdle to the bucket and then to the rope. All right, this women are going to be getting the water that day. I guess so. I don't know. But there's there's something, there's one thing about, um, about in verse 2. There's something I thought about in verse 2. Um, the, verse, the verse said that the Pharisees watched and protested disciples. Is watching take work? Does it take work to watch somebody intently? Does it? I don't, I'm just saying, you don't got to answer. You can just think about this. Does is, is it take work to watch somebody? Is... Um, is protesting work? Is debating or protesting somebody? Is that work? I'll just throw them out there for some um, for, the, for for you to, for for you to think about. What about arguing? Is arguing arguing takes work? Could arguing or debating be considered work? You know, I, I just think there's just some interesting questions right here that we that we could we could we could just we can we, that I just brought, came to the surface. 
All right, let's continue in verse 3. But in the next couple of verses, Jesus shows us three kingdom principles. Verse 3, Jesus said to them, to the Pharisees, Haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he, when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of the Lord, the house of God, and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only priests are allowed to eat. So Jesus brought up David's experience with the priests and the holy bread. Um, there was no regular bread. David was uh, David was hungry. He was in, he was out in battle. He was there was no regular bread. So the priest gave David holy bread to eat. It was only for the priest. But Jesus wanted the disciples. Uh, he wanted I'm sorry. He wanted the Pharisees to know that this number one principle: human need human need is more important um, than observing ceremonial rituals. Human need. I'm going to write down say one more time. Human need is more important than observing, than observing ceremonial rituals. And I want you to hear this. At times in our walk, at times in our walk, because we're all walking right now, we might have to do things that go against tradition or preference. We might have to do things that go against tradition or preference. Sometimes we have to do things different. And sometimes... It might not be comfortable. You might not like it, but it has to be done. Where's my amen at? Amen. amen. But it has to. It has to be done. These things. I'm, I want to. I want to get this clear. That these things are not immoral. They're not unethical. But they go against tradition. They go against preference. They go against um, culture. But they got to be done. Not because I sound, but because the Bible says it. The Bible makes it clear. But I love the Bible. I love the, how many people have watched the Chosen, Chosen Bible teaching series? The Chosen. I love the Chosen Bible series. In one scene, Jesus is talking to the disciple, uh, to a disciple or someone, and he says, he says this, get used to different. Get used to different. I believe we have to, we have to, we have to embrace this reality. We have to embrace getting used to different, or we're going to wind up like the Pharisees, all legalistic, and that just doing things because that's the way it's been done before. If you, if you learn, if you, if you learn anything about Jesus, he didn't, he didn't do things. He did things the way God told him to do it. So God's will will ultimately trump preferences and tradition. Amen. Verse five. And haven't you read in the law of Moses? He gave him, this is the second principle. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priest on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? So Jesus also presented the uh, principle number two. The Pharisees themselves broke the Sabbath all the time because they worked on the Sabbath. Jesus was, was politely saying, Pharisees, shut up. He said, shut your mouth. The temple, and I, I want to go and go deeper in this, the temple ritual will always involve work. Didn't it? Sacrifice. The, 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 the temple ritual always involved work. The kindling of fire, they had a fire they had to make. The slaughter and preparation of animals. The lifting of the animals onto the altar and other things like that. They had to be done. And that's work. And the work was doubled on, doubled on Sabbath. We're not just talking, we're talking about double the portion. The Sabbath required offerings that were doubled. But I, I believe I, I believe that um, that verse five shows that the Pharisees didn't understand as much about Sabbath as they thought they did. I think this is true for many Christians and churches. We do things and we behave in ways we're limited or no understanding. We say it's just the way it is. It's the way it's always been. Jesus says this is destructive. This is destructive thinking that is keeping us from experiencing His Father's kingdom fully. If you want God to manifest, you do what He you do what He says. You don't do what you want to do. You do what he says. If you want to see God show up, if God said, I don't care if he tells you, get on the floor and roll around like a little baby, like a little kid, you do what he says. I don't care if he tells you to take some mud and put it in somebody's eyes, on somebody's eyes, and they're going to be healed. I don't care, I don't care if it goes against your, your medicine, it goes against science. I don't, it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter. Because God knows what he's doing, and we don't. We got to stay humble. Stay humble for, for God's kingdom. Verse 6, I tell you, there is one here who is greater than the temple. All right, this won't get him in trouble. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, 
not offer sacrifices. This principle number three. And I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. This is this comes from Hosea 6.6. 6. And it talks about Israel and Judah's lack of prioritizing. Because the kingdom, kingdom of God is about prioritization, about prioritizing. God wanted Israel and Judah's heart not to sacrifice. He don't need, you know what? God don't need anything from you. He just wants your heart. He wants your obedience. He wants you, he wants, he wants it. If he says something to you, you say Y-E-S and not I guess. But Israel and Judah, they were sacrificing to God, but it was done in vain. It wasn't done with a heart. It wasn't done with a heart, a heart for God. It was just done for a heart for the ritual, for the for the preference, for the for the old ways of doing things. But the, the disciples didn't do anything wrong. They were hungry and they wanted to eat. And the Pharisees didn't care about this. If you care about somebody, if you're hungry, what are you gonna do with them? You're gonna feed them, aren't you? If you come to my house and you're hungry, I'm not gonna sit here and just be like, yeah, hold on for a minute. I'm gonna finish my steak and I'll come out when I'm done. That's not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna feed you. I don't, it doesn't matter if you got a, like, a couple things in your refrigerator. You're gonna eat if you come to my house because, because that's what you do. You, you care about, we care about people, right? But the disciples didn't do anything wrong. It's the Pharisees that did things wrong. Their traditions were more important than the, than the disciples' hunger. That's not right. The, the love of traditions and preferences and superficial, and superficial things will ultimately keep you from over owning your faith. God won't move unless you allow him to. Let's go to verse 8. For the Son of Man is Lord even over Sabbath. Jesus said he was greater than the temple, that he was over the Sabbath. The Pharisees' heads must have been spinning. I can see them right now getting off. They're, they're probably, their face got red. But they didn't, they didn't embrace the fact that Jesus was the living word of God. We, they read about it, but they didn't embrace the fact that he was, he was the word of God made flesh. And when you don't own your faith, it leads to foolishness. It leads to foolishness. It leads you to legalism. It leads you to bad doctrine, which eventually will lead you right to hell. All right. Now, now this even gets better right here. Let's go to nine, verse 9. After he said all this to the Pharisees and they were spinning, they were red hot and just ready to probably just throw, throw some rocks at his head. Then Jesus went over to, to, the, to their synagogue where, where he noticed a man with a deformed hand. The Pharisees asked Jesus, does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? And they were hoping that he would say yes, so they could bring charges against him. And Jesus had just, and you got to think about Jesus, had just gave them three truths about living a, faith, a life of faith and not a life of legalism. And Jesus, in verse 11, he said, he, and Jesus answered, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, would you work to pull it out? If you had a child who fell into a well on Sabbath, would you pull your child out? Would you? You'd pull your child out. Of course you would. In my Bible version, in my Bible version, it would say, of course you would, you big dummy. That's what, that's what it would say. Yes, you big dummy, you would pull it out, your sheep, a child, somebody, any, you, know, it, you would pull it out. Verse 12, and how much more valuable, valuable is a person than a sheep? A lot more valuable, right? Than a sheep. Yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. You can do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, hold, your, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored. Miracle. Just like the other one. Then the Pharisees caught a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. Owning your faith can get you killed. Owning your faith will get people to plot against you. Owning your faith can be dangerous. But let's, but let's, let's be real. We are called to live dangerous lives for the kingdom. We are called to live dangerous lives for the kingdom. I don't care, what, I don't care if, what, where you live at, if you're in America, if you're in Australia, or whatever you are, but we are called to live dangerous lives for the kingdom. And this means speaking truth. It means walking in integrity. It means going against popular opinion, doing it God's way. 
So being a disciple of Jesus is not easy. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. And, and, and we have to realize this. It might, it might cost you time. It might cost you money. It might cost you friendships. It might cost you your life. But are you willing to own your faith even if it costs you these things and many more? That, that's a question only us, we can answer as a person, as an individual. Are you willing to own your faith? But right now, I want to show you a, pic, a picture, a pic of the disciples on how they, on how they went out. These are the 12 dis dis disciples right here. And it says, Andrew was crucified. Uh, Bar 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 Bartholomew was beaten and crucified. James, the son of uh, Elphias, stoned to death. Um, James, the son of Zebedee, he's beheaded, cut his head chopped off. John, he was born in oil, he was born in some, born in some crystal. But when it fell, he was exiled to the island of Patmos when he died at old age. He was born. He was born in some, some crystal, some oil. Uh, verse uh, I mean, number six, uh, uh, disciple number six, apostle number six, Judas. That's um, that's. Uh, he's also named as, uh, known as Thaddeus. He was stoned to death. Rocks. Of uh, uh, Matthew, speared to death. Peter crucified upside down. Philip crucified. Simon crucified. Thomas speared to death. Matthias, who took over Judea, Judas. Um, Iscariot, um, he was stoned to death and Judas died, of, he killed himself, right? So they all went out, they all went out, not really great, not really great. But I want, but I want to ask you, I want to ask each one of you, are you willing to go like these men? Are you willing to die for your faith? Because it could happen today, it could happen tomorrow, it could happen next week, but are you willing to die for your faith? If somebody had a gun to your head or a knife, are you willing to take the, the gunshot? Are you willing to get your head cut off? Or if you say, I declare Jesus as my Lord. Yeah. We, we, have to be, we have to get to that level of owning our faith that, you know what, regardless of if it's life, if, if, we, if we stay alive, or if we're in prison, if we just die by the sword, we have to say, I'm, I'm going to own my faith. I'm going to choose Jesus. We're going to stop here, but I want to, I want to look at one verse in uh, James. I know we're going a little bit over, but I'm going to look at one verse in James. This is from James 1.22. It says, in this, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. We are called to be doers and not hearers. Not just hearers. If you remember, you know, God gave me the word at the beginning of the year for our church. It said James 1, it was the same verse, James 1, 22, be doers. And I think the theme was just do it. And I, don't, I, didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was, that was um, you know, I was going to be using that verse um, today. But it's like, I know God wants us to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. He wants us to walk. He wants us to, um, active in our walk. And, and we're active in our walk. By submitting, by obeying, by participating and trusting. And I want to encourage everybody today to keep grinding for the kingdom. Keep grinding. Keep on doing what God's asking you to do. Even if your family says, um, says you're crazy. Even if you feel like you don't feel like doing it. Many times we get up, we don't feel like, we don't feel like being, um, being a kingdom disciple that day because maybe we have something going on. We have our legs hurting, our, our, we have a headache. So I just, want, I just want to encourage you to keep running your race and don't give up. The kingdom of heaven is near. We're, we're, we're learning about it in Revelation. The kingdom of heaven is near. The rapture, even though we can't set dates, we, we know it's right around the corner. But in closing, owning your faith requires having a knowledge of God, hearing the word of God, and living out the word of God. Living it out. When you do these things, your faith will grow leaps and bounds. If you want your faith to grow and continue to grow, I want you to shout amen. 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 All right. If you could bow your heads right now, we're going to pray. Dear God, we just we thank you for today. We thank you for this message, God, this message of, of owning our faith. God, we want to live it out. We want to, we want to, we want to live it out and, and, and be real. God, every day I think about just, you know what, being real. We want to be real. We want to be authentic. We want to be genuine. We want to do it your way, regardless of where we are, who's in our, in, our, in, our, in our presence, God. And God, help us, God. We're going through a battle. We're going through a spiritual battle every day. And this battle is, is, is unlike any battle that we fight. We're not fighting against people. We're fighting against 
uh, principalities, spirits, God. And God, we have to be, we have to, we just got to continue just looking to you, keeping our eyes focused on, on you because you've already defeated, you've already, you've already won the battle. And the, but the devil and, and, and other people, the devil uses the puppet of the devil, demon, people that are demon oppressed, they want us to take our eyes off of you and look at our circumstances, look at our problems, and look at anything but you. But today we charge, we're going to continue keeping focused. We're going to continue just looking at you. God, we thank you, God. We thank you for just being with us, God. We, the Holy Spirit sent us and the Holy Spirit guides and directs us and comforts us and gives us peace. So God, thank you but God, help us live this all. Help us live out our, our Christian walk. God, it's not about a Sunday or a Wednesday thing. It's a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day lifestyle. And God, you called us to that. You called us to, you called us to live it out. You called us to a lifestyle. We do things when we don't feel like doing. We pray when we don't feel like praying. We read the Bible when we don't feel like reading the Bible. But we do it. We because we have to, because you've asked us to. And God, we know that our, we know what the, the reward is. The reward is heaven, God. I know that every, some, sometimes it seems like this is going to last forever, This our time on earth, but it's not. It's going to come to an end. Everything we see is going to come to an end. And, 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 when, and, when, and when things happen, if there's not going to, we're going to, every knee is going to bow. Every knee is going to bow eventually. I don't care. I don't care if, they, if they're not bowing out, they're going to bow because you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But right now, I just I want to ask everybody, I want to ask people here, people on Facebook right now, if you passed away today, if you died today, if you were in a car accident when you got home, if or on the way home, if there's something happened to you, do you know where you're going? Because the Bible says it's either heaven or it's hell. Hell, eternal separation from God. Heaven, eternity with God. The streets of, the, the streets of uh, heaven are made of gold. Everything is vibrant, colors that we never could see. But the, the greatest thing is, 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 is being with you, God, forever and ever in eternity. So I want to make this, I want to, I want to, I want to offer this, this, this uh, proposal to um, people that are watching, people here. Um, if you want to make Jesus Lord of your life and, and, and give up your ways and do it God's way and, and accept Jesus in your heart, I want you to raise your hand. And if you raise your, if you if you did raise your hand, you and you um, and you uh, you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to repeat after me, dear God, I come to you humbly and choose to surrender my life to you. I know that I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. Today, I confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of my life. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, was raised from the dead three days later so I could have eternal life. Father God, fill me with your spirit so I can know you, so I can experience you, so I can serve you, so I can live the rest of my life for you. I ask this in Jesus' name, the name above every name. Amen. All right, if this was you and you, and you said this, this, you said this prayer and you meant it, you just received Jesus as your Savior. I want to encourage you to find a church that you feel comfortable at. We would love you to come here. Um, we, would love, we have some great people here that would like to walk with you and disciple you in this new walk. And, um, um, you made the greatest decision in your life right now. You made the greatest decision. You know, time is ticking. You don't understand? Time is ticking. We are on a time clock um, with eternity. The rapture, when the rapture happens, it's, it's ticking. The time's ticking right now. And we're going we're gonna to be there eventually. The rapture's going to happen. So one, one day you might be sitting there and stuff. You just fly up in the air. I'll fly, just so I'm saying that, that song that we sing today. I'll fly away. It's going to happen one day. It's going to happen. But the rest of us right here, does anybody have, does anybody here have any prayer needs, any prayer requests? Okay, just like we always talk, like I always say, you know what, we are all ministers of the gospel. We all use our gifts. We all get to use them, not just one or two people, but everybody. 
Because that's the, that's the type of house we are. That's the, type, the house of God. Everybody gets to play and pray and do everything they, that God's called us to do. So if you could surround her and just pray for her. Or if I could have everybody come up in front, because um, Catherine, she was t telling me and stuff, in which I, you know, I, I felt, I felt this week about spiritual opposition. I want to come up. I want to have everybody come up here and pray, just for our church, for uh, individuals, for our church. So because I feel like, I feel like um, something, something was really off this week. Something was off. It's, it's like we can get into a circle, or whatever, and um, and just pray, man. Just, just pray. <coughs> just, just pray. Just pray. All right, dear God, we just we just thank you, God. We just God, we come to you, God. We I just I just feel that um, Captain put it out to me, and I and I, I feel in my spirit that we're under opposition, God. We're we're going to different, we're going to new territory, God. We're going we're expanding, God. And with expansion, we're going to other nations, God. Like in Old Testament, we go to other nations. They have foreign gods, some of them, literally, God. We're going to like we're we're going to um, we're going to a territory where there's other religions, God, but they don't they don't actually. Um, serve the one true God. So God, just, could you just God, I just pray for protection, a, a protection for each one of us, God, because the devil will come. He's coming to kill, steal, and destroy us, our kids, our families, God. 
So God, just um, watch over us, God. And just, yes, and, and just and protect us, God. Protect our health, God. Protect the, pr give us peace, God. Um, God, I know, I, I, I sense it, God. I sense yeah, that. It's the so, word to say. This is the word to say, God. I'm saying, just God, I just, just, let's just pray. Let's all pray right now. Pray in the spirit if you can. Pray in the spirit if you can. All right. <laughs>
trying to do it, but you can just feel the heaviness and pressure. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like. Well, let's pray for this stuff. Okay. Specifically. God, the battle, the battle starts in the mind, God. The battle, the battle, the, the devil, the devil wants our mind, he wants our heart, he wants our uh, he wants life, our life, our children, our fear, 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 Prabhu, to spiritual, uh, to like Prabhu, heat garage, Prabhu, to spiritually watch around Prabhu, chance of growth, like development, like Prabhu, to find it, to focus around Prabhu, Kori, Puriyapra, Spree, to realize, to chance of Shuri, to point out Prabhu, I would never know Prabhu, and about the just more. We thank you so much for the gracious time. God, I do think we need to be lifting up Laura, mm -hmm. specifically Laura. She is just. She is going into un, unclaimed territory in her neighborhood, God. And so, God, we just ask you to lay this around her home. Yes, Lord. That you have a special uh, protection over her as she's going out, God. And we know that these kids aren't going to harm her, but the enemy is going to go after yes. her. And he's going to go after the little things. Mm -hmm. And he's going to let in, you know, the, the little mice and the little boxes. little foxes to come in and steal this from her, Lord. So in Jesus' name, we claim Laura's home is a sanctuary for you. I claim energy for Laura, Lord. God, just bless these children, these children that are drawn to Laura. God, I pray for salvation for every single child. I pray for salvation for every single child's home, that their homes will come to know you, Lord, through through Laura's ministry and her reaching out, God. But God, the the, the windshield is just weird. There's just weird stuff happening, God, and we know when it's weird and it doesn't make sense where it comes from. So we just ask that you bless her. Pray for Sonia's health, God. Pray for wisdom for the doctors, but more, I just pray for a supernatural mm -hmm. healing in her body, God, that she doesn't even need to go to the doctor, mm -hmm. Lord. It's just the attacks of the enemy, God, on all of us. I pray for our pastor, God. He's been struggling, mm -hmm. and it's because he's yes, really Lord. trying to be obedient to you, God. And so in Jesus' name, we break off depression. We break off anxiety. We break off anger in Jesus' name. And these aren't things to be ashamed of because we all struggle with them, but God, they come after him, Lord. He, the enemy knows his playbook, and they know what, what he struggles with, God. So in Jesus' name, I just pray a supernatural joy over our pastor. Yes, I pray yes. a hope over our pastor. Yes. I pray that he is going to walk out with a confidence in knowing that he is doing your work and your will, and he is leading us, God. And God, we just, we just continue to ask humbly, God, that you use us. Mm -hmm. Use us. Don't let these things push us away. Mm -hmm. Don't let these things scare us, God, that we won't be able to enter in. I don't want us to be afraid by what the apostles went through, Lord. Mm -hmm. Let us see that as our work for you, mm -hmm. God. Let us see that we're running the race. If we're not getting persecuted, we're not doing anything. Mm -hmm. And so, Jesus, we thank you that we can see the evidence of, of awakening the darkness, the evidence that we are stepping into the territory where we're not welcome. But, God, we also just ask that you go before us. Mm -hmm. Protect us. Be with us, Father. Thank you. I just want to pray this very quick before we leave. Uh, this is uh, this is from uh, Numbers. You can sit down if you want to. Uh, Numbers 6, 24 to 26. May the Lord bless you and protect you this week. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you this week. May the Lord show you his favor and give you peace this week. God, I just I pray, God, like Catherine said, you know, and all of us are praying, God, that just protect us, God, just protect our bodies, our minds, God, our families, God, our, our vehicles, God. We're, 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 we're doing things, and the devil is, is, is mad. He's irritated because we're taking over his territory. We're taking over, we're, we're show, bringing light where it's darkness at. God, protect us at work, God, when when we're when, when customers and, and people come to us and we they, they, they talk to us and we tell them the good news and the good news of the gospel, and, and, we're, and we just, we're, we're feeling like, 
We're just feeling that stress and that burden. But God, God, you're a good God and you love us and you take care of us. So God, just I, I just I just want you to keep us, God. Keep us until we meet again. Um, protect us. And, and God, just we just we 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 put all of our we put all of everything we have we, we put it in your hand. That's what we have to do. We have to give it all to God. Ninety. We got to give a hundred percent, not ninety ninety nine point nine percent. A hundred percent. We lay it at your feet. We lay, we lay it at the. Um, the throne of your cross, the throne of the, your throne, you, the throne of your throne. We lay it there. We give it to you. We give all our worries. We give all our distractions. We give any, everything, our insecurities. God, we give it to you, and we and you are, you're going to exchange it for good. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.